ABTM, focused on encouraging private sector engagement in ABTM. We have gathered here to explore the incredible potential that lies at the intersection of healthcare and innovation, and to harness the collective power of public and private sectors to drive transformative change in digital health. Private sector is a major stakeholder in Indian healthcare ecosystem. Their engagement has always been a challenge. The experts in this interesting panel discussions would focus on this issue by closely examining how ABTM has increased its footprint in the private healthcare sector since its launch, as well as discussing various strategies and its potential areas for growth and improvement. I'm honored to stand here today to introduce our esteemed speakers who will grace our dais with their expertise and insights. Our chair for this session will be Sri Vichal Chauhanji, sir. He is an IS officer of the 1998 batch and he is posted as the Joint Secretary at the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, New Delhi. His expertise has supported in shaping healthcare policy. Our co-chair for today will be Dr. Karthik Adapa, sir. He is an IS officer of the 2007 batch and a special secretary to the government of Punjab, Department of Health and Family Welfare. Dr. Adapa is a practitioner, researcher, and an educator. He has recently completed his PhD in health informatics from UNC Ch uh, Chapel Hills. Now, I would request our speakers to come on the dais. Ms. First, Mr. Neil Ratan, sir. He serves as an advisor for the National Health Authority. He's consulting professional with over 33 years of experience and also served at PwC. He's also a senior advisor to UNICEF and a distinguished fellow at the World Economic Forum. Our next speaker for today, Dr. Oman Chanda, sir. He's a managing director of Dr. Lal Path Lab. He has successfully led the transformation of LPN in the last 18 years from a small business to a professionally run listed company. Then our next speaker, Dr. Sutapa B. Niyogi. Dr. Sutapa Niyogi currently serving as the director of the International Institute of Health Management Research, Delhi, is a highly esteemed public health specialist. Our last speaker for today, Mr. Vikal Sahani, sir. He's a founder and CEO of Aneka Care, a connected health tech platform solving for users and doctors. Mr. Vikalp also volunteered and led the tech execution of the world largest contact tracing effort, Arogya Setu. At last, please join me in welcoming our moderator for today, for this session, Mr. Vikram Pagaria, sir. He's an officer of the Indian Revenue Service and has been posted as a joint director at National Health Authority. He is responsible for accelerating adoption of digital health at NHG. Now, sir, I would like to hand over the stage to you for further proceedings and deliberations of this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I welcome all the participants for this panel on encouraging private sector engagement under the ABDM ecosystem. <laughs> so along with me, Dr. Athapa Karthik, uh, Dr. Vikalp Sahani, Dr. Sut uh, Sutapa Bandhupadhyaya Niyogi Ji, Shri Om Manchanda Ji, Shri Neel Ratan Ji, and we have the, our moderator, uh, uh, Shri Vikram Pagaria Ji is also here. So I welcome all my co-panelists for this session. Uh, we are, we, we, today we are going to discuss how to encourage private sector engagement. Uh, the beauty of the AVDM system is that, you know, it is, it, it is seamless and it cut, cut across public sector, private sector. And I always teal the, teach the NHM author, NHA authorities that, you know, whatever you do, uh, ultimately the NHM or the public health program are the biggest consumer of all your initiatives. And you'll be surprised to know that we have around 40, 50 portals or uh, dashboards we are using in the, in the health ministry. And the biggest problem with all these portals that they were not talking to each other. And uh, we had data, uh, so, so I uh, often give an, give an example that, you know, if Niksha portal is maintaining data related to TB patient, 
and uh, RCS portal is uh, uh, maintaining data related to pregnant women. And if pregnant woman is having TB also, the, 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 uh, the RCS portal does not know. And then, uh, so, so th these portals do not talk to each other. So it becomes a high risk pregnancy, but, but there are no way that these portals can talk to each other. And then, of course, the challenges of multiple data entry by the various, you know, healthcare providers. So our CHOs or our ANMs or ASHA has to done a, a, a data entry in the portal Nikshay. Then again, same father's name, mother's name, all these things, again, data entry into the uh, NCD portal, then in Nikshay portal, then in RCH portal, then in viral hepatitis control portal, then in blindness control portal, you name it and we have a, you name a disease, we have a portal in the ministry. So after COVID, uh, the biggest experience was that, you know, the, any portal or any software system has to be as simple as only three to four fields. The COVID gave us this, you know, simple, uh, uh, you know, we got the, realized this, that the simpler the portal is, it is more effective. So I tell always my team that we should stop monitoring that, you know, what happened after first visit, what happened after the second visit. We should know, you know, what is the coverage we are able to do. And then also we, we started all our portals, data entry. So at the first step, all our portals are now almost M1 integrated. So the moment we enter name, we generate ABA ID. If it is created, we seed it. If it is not there, we create it. And then after that, then we have N2 integrations and then we have M3 integration. So, so uh, I give you, you know, and it has really, really very beneficial if, if I talk of the pub public sector use of ABDM ecosystem. And as I said, the health is cutting across. Sometime I go to a go government sector, sometime I go to a private sector. I do a government sector for lab report, I go to a private sector, or sometime I get lab report done in the government sector. So it has to be a seamless integration between the government sector or the private sector. Then only we'll be able to realize the full potential of the uh, ABDM ecosystem. Now, if I give you an example, I, I'm using, you know, uh, one is I'm very, very heavily used portal is the national NCD portal where I have 45 crore records. 45 crore individuals are registered in the NCD portal. Uh, 30 plus population is 30 crore, 17 crore is screening for hypertension, 15 crore is screening for diabetes, and then one crore people are, are on treatment. Our target is to take it to the 7.5 crore uh, by the year 2025. So by, by ABDM ecosystem, we are able to track a patient. For you, those who are aware that hypertension and diabetes, one has to be monitored on a monthly basis and get medicine on a monthly basis. Now, if somebody from sub health center referred to a primary health center, earlier I was not having no idea or no way how I can approach that patient or how can remind that patient. Now, through AVA ID, if I, I have a QR code at all these facilities and you, I am using the same portal like NCD portal, then I can track, you know, XYZ was referred uh, to the PSC, whether he has reached PSC or not. And if, if PSC, he was given medicine, then he was supposed, he was directed to collect his monthly medicine from the uh, sub-center, whether he is collecting his monthly medicine or not. And whether his hypertension or diabetes is in control or not, that is the ultimate objective. So in between, if somebody going to a private sector or somebody is not in the city or maybe there is a stock out, somebody buying medicine from outside. So at least there has to be recording of data. So, so it has to be seamlessly between the private sector and the uh, public sector. So it is very, very useful. Another example I give of the dialysis. Uh, we have a PM national dialysis portal. So dialysis can be under PMJY, it can be a government facility or it can be a private facility. Under uh, PM national dialysis program, it can be, a, it can be in, in the uh, government facility most of the time in the district hospitals. Then there are state government schemes like Arugashiri and all where this dialysis can be in, again, government sector or private sector. There can be dialysis in the ESI hospital. There can be dialysis in the railway hospital. So, so if everybody, and there can be purely dialysis in the private sector. So if everybody is using a ABDM ecosystem, then at least I know how many people, I, I have a registry of the people who are suffering from dialysis. 
And then uh, now the Angdan Abhiyan is going on from 17th of September. So under NOTO website, today we have received about 25,000 organ donation pledge. So if I know how many people are on dialysis, they are patients who are waiting for the kidney. And also in the NOTO, I know I maintain a database with uh, both with the ABHA ID or with the ADHA seeded. So I know these are the people who are ready for the uh, for, for donation uh, in case if anybody require. So that kind of a linkage is possible with the help of ADHA, ABHA ID and ADHA. So uh, I just, uh, I will not take much of time because we have a lot of panelists here. Uh, but my suggestion will be and my argument will be that whether it is a government sector, I was seeing this data, the uses of ABDM ecosystem in the in the government sector uh, uh, is, is, is quite increasing very fast, but in the private sector, it is very, very less. And ultimately, it, it has to be, and also like uh, Dr. Manjanda is here, as far as the lab reports are concerned, like, so, uh, so wherever we get an opportunity, whether it is a lab or it is a, it is a uh, um, drug disbursement or it is a, it is a you know, uh, prescription, or whatever is there, uh, we have, we should able to capture the record, we should comply our system with the ABDM ecosystem. So, uh, so it will be very, very beneficial for everybody and the other two components of making a, you know, facility registry and as well as the patient registry, uh, sorry, the professional uh, health registry. So, uh, health professional registry. So, so there are also today, so many people pass out, but we don't know whether we have these. Today we don't know if somebody asks me how many, how many anesthesiologists are there in the country, how many nephrologists are, are there in the country. We, we probably don't have data except the maintained by their association. So if we maintain this database, then, then at least we, and keep on updating this database, then we know how many mental health professionals are there in the country, how many done in public health and no, no longer doing the practice or how many have done MBA are, are into other things, how many have gone abroad. So that kind of a database in maintain, it will be very, very helpful for maintenance of the facilities. UP is getting a data every month, his principal secretary is getting a data that how many facilities I don't have a, a doctor this month, how somebody transferred, somebody resigned, so all these things. So if we have this data, it will be very, very useful for policy planners, for, for everybody to, you know, to plan whether we have to ha have more seats in X category or Y category or that kind of a thing. So uh, with these words, I end my uh, submission, but uh, I, I am very eager to listen to all my co-panelists uh, and how we can encourage the role of private sector and how we can have in seamless connectivity between the uh, uh, private sector and public sector as far as the ABDM uh, ecosystem is there. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, so much, sir. Uh, I'll give the mic to Adappa Karthik, sir, for his initial remarks. But before that, I just want to set the stage in uh, a couple of minutes uh, about the why this separate and panel discussion for this important topic because um, the importance of private sector is huge and 70% of our healthcare is in the is from the private sector uh, in abdm we have about 31 crore abha linked records but out of that only 16 lakh crore 16 lakh records are from the private sector the rest are from all from government sector uh, it seems uh, there is a lot there is lot to be done in the private sector and um, we have done taken several initiatives here at NHA, uh, we have rolled out the digital health incentive schemes, which provides an incentive of uh, rupees 20 per digital record and uh, incentives up to rupees 4 crore for a health facility or a health tech company. Uh, we have rolled out the 100 microsite program, which is a focused uh, adoption of small clinics and uh, even uh, we have been able to successfully digitize various small clinics in. Uh, in uh, in Dharavi uh, uh, of uh, Dharavi area of uh, Mumbai, um, we have held uh, various uh, integration workshops wherein we re uh, request all the health tech companies to come physically with their technical teams, and our technical team is there to handle them, support them, get them integrated. Um, 
trying to do uh, trying to give a specific focus on laboratories because all the lab reports as you know are uh, more or less digitized and that is why we have uh, um manchanda ji with us and uh, we're trying to give a specific focus also on pharmacy uh, uh, pharmacy sector wherein if a patient goes uh, how can his health record be his or her health record be digitized uh, we are also uh, we have a uh, we have uh, got a very good uh, response from our scan and share initiative which has uh, helped about uh, 82 lakh uh, uh, individuals in uh, getting speedier opd registration we are trying to uh, expand on that, ride on that, and create more useful cases so that all the pain points in the patient's journey um, uh, we are able to address and we at least give some tangible benefit uh, out of ABHA card to an individual. Uh, we have received feedback that awareness of ABDM and ABHA is, uh, is a concern. We are trying to work uh, on that part. Uh, we have tied up with IRCTC, uh, Radio FM, uh, All India Radio to create uh, media bites. We are working on print media uh, advertisements, but uh, trying to work on, on that. And uh, taking some diseases like cancer we have working with national cancer grid uh, to make uh, to explain to an individual the utility of longitudinal health records and how it is beneficial uh, to the individual um, these are some of the things that we are doing and we will deliberate more on uh, these as we go forward but now i'll pass on the mic to uh, dappa kartik sir for his initial remarks and then we can have all panelists talking about uh, thank you, Vikram. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I know after a sumptuous lunch, uh, to make the last ones active, involved, and engaged is, a, is a quite a challenge. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll kind of uh, lay the ground uh, and create a landscape. I also want to be very upfront uh, in the fact that I don't have a very deep-rooted understanding of what has really happened in the digital health space in India. So some of what I know is probably going to be very peripheral to you, but what I can actually do is I spent about seven years in the US uh, and work very closely as an oncology informatician in large healthcare systems like Yale, Stanford, and at UNC Chapel Hill. So what I'll, what I'll do is I'll try and give a landscape on how the US, right from 2004 to 2023, how did it really increase adoption of private healthcare facilities? And what are lessons that we can learn from the US? Uh, and at a similar pace as China has started from where in 2007, and now by 2023, China has also essentially reached the same level of private healthcare facility adoption. So what are the lessons that we can learn from both these two countries? Because essentially some of those architectural aspects that NHA has and what we're doing in India is, is world class. So there are lessons that we've essentially learned from the US and uh, the West. Uh, so there are essentially lessons that we can learn in how do you really make this private healthcare adoption? How do we really increase it? So I want to kind of lay the ground by talking about who are those four major stakeholders. The first uh, stakeholder is, of course, the health facility. So what did the US government do in terms of helping the healthcare facil facilities adopt EHR systems in the US? The first thing that they did was they, had, they came up with financial incentives. Now, in, in the High Tech Act, uh, which was passed in 2009, what the US government essentially said was every healthcare system whether they use a basic EHR system or a certified EHR system. Over three years, they need to adopt it, and then they need to sustain it for three years. Now, the other strategy that the US government had was instead of catering to these disintegrated, fragmented private providers, they focused on large private healthcare centers. So essentially, what would be equivalent to our Apollos and Max hospitals, what the US government did was it captured into large, big healthcare systems in the private sector, gave them a large number of financial incentives, ensured that they sustained using this EHR adoption for at least three years. And if they did not sustain after three years, there were disincentives as well. So one is you have a regulatory framework and then you have financial incentives so that you can help them with costs. So that's one major stakeholder. Second, you have providers. Now providers are extremely important. 
Now, I'm a provider myself. I'm a, I went to medical school in India, and I have worked with a system where we had papers, but now when you work in a digital system, we most often assume that you build a digital system and people will adopt that. It does not happen like that. Because medicine is both an art and a science. So two endocrinologists tr would treat the same patient very differently. So you would want your EHR system to be designed, developed, and customized to specific user, to specific provider. So how do you truly do that? Now that is something which even large uh, EHR vendors in the US, like Epic and Cerner, are still struggling with. So one is because providers, when you give them these large, massive health information systems, what is going to happen is there's going to be burnout in them. When there is burnout in them, what's going to happen is it's going to result in patient safety. They're going to result in large number of medical errors. So, so understanding what the provider truly wants. So in this conversation of private health facilities adopting EHR, what is very important is to bring providers on board. The other one, the other key stakeholder, which we typically don't really engage, is patients, for instance. The US also has learned in a very hard way that as we build EHR systems now, we have patient advocacy groups who are constantly involved in these conversations. Yes, a EHR vendor, when he, when he uh, implements any EHR system in any hospital in the US, has to undergo an FDA regulation, which means there is testing in the lab, there is, of course, an entire certification process, but the patient is also involved now in the testing process, not just the provider alone. Now, are we having patients as a part of the conversation here as well? The th fourth major stakeholder, again, is these EHR vendors or the HMIS vendors. Now, what does a vendor typically need? Now, in the US, there are four major statutes, major laws that the US has come out with. One is, of course, the High Tech Act that I talked to you about. Then there's also the HIPAA Act, uh, which is the Privacy Act. They also have the Patient Safety and Quality Improvement Act. So what it typically does is, as a provider, if I do a mistake, if I do, if I commit an error in the medical system in the, uh, while treating a patient, I can voluntarily disclose that I committed this mistake. Now, this is, a some, this is something which is truly remarkable. We do talk about patient safety in India, but we've still not had open conversations to admit that physicians, when they interact with the healthcare system, when they interact with technology, are likely to commit errors. Now, when they commit these errors, for example, in the US, there was a very revolutionary paper that came from Hopkins, which said that medical errors are the third commonest cause of death in the US. Now, that was a paper that was heavily criticized for its methodology, but what that paper really did is the society, the country, and the government has acknowledged that providers are human beings and they're likely to commit human errors. Now, this is a, and that led to this conversation and built a massive act called the Patient Safety and Quality Improvement Act. Now, what this act has done is when, when a provider does a mistake in, uh, in an EPIC or an EHR system, they can report it out to the hospital and the health facility and there'll be no punitive action against them. The other cube, other interesting part is the US government also came with something called a Cures Act. Now it's a very interesting act. What this act really does is it tells, it gives power to the patient that each time you have an encounter with the, with the physician, the physician writes a note. Now typically if some of you are doctors, you would know that when you write a note, you're writing a note to communicate with another provider. You're not writing a note to communicate with the patient because the language that the physician uses is a language that another physician can understand. Now in the Cures Act, it has made it mandatory that providers have to share this information, share this note to the patient. Now the US itself, the US healthcare systems itself, have taken four years to just adopt that. So the EHR vendors therefore are in an extremely delicate space. They, they, don't have a, they don't have a statutory backup. Now, they don't have statute to protect for privacy concerns. They don't have a statute to protect, for, to give them incentives, and we don't protect them for patient safety as well. So I want to kind of just flag these broad issues across these four stakeholders, and I know we have other panelists as well. I want to open the ground and see if others have any thoughts. But these are my opening remarks, and thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, you uh, threw light on the regulatory framework that, uh, uh, and the legal levers that could be used to promote adoption. I'll uh, move on to uh, Vikalp. Uh, Vikalp, you have uh, um, at Ekakir been the uh, 
top integrator who in ABDM um, having leaked about 10 lakh odd records, 40 lakh hours. What what is your uh, advice and what are your inputs as to what is missing in uh, ABDM strategy or NHA strategy? Yeah, thank you uh, and thanks for inviting me here. Uh, this is uh, a very interesting forum and we are a big believer in ABDM as a mission. But before uh, uh, we touch upon the misses, I think uh, two years we have seen many changes that has actually resulted in where we are, one of the largest creator of health ID slash linking of records. I think the way ABDM ecosystem and the platform has evolved from V1 to V3 uh, where the APIs are far more reliable, far more simpler, be it on the PHR side or an HMI side, it's just brilliant. I think scan and share was that beautiful aha moment that all of us uh, were looking for, where a patient immediately will get uh, a gratification that can suddenly improve the experience, which is which has also uh, uh, made a lot of these uh, things possible for us. DHIS again is uh, a very important initiative and I think that uh, has resulted not only uh, companies like us but when we go out and talk uh, to the various providers especially physicians we are able to uh, explain to them how important this is and how this can uh, be of an immediate gratification. So these are something very interesting and I'm, I'm a pretty optimist uh, that this uh, sometimes all of these uh, a large population level changes, they take time. You take any of these, be it Aadhaar, UPI, we all talk about these large uh, digital public goods uh, solving at a population scale, but they also took time. Couple of areas where we feel, I think uh, there has been, uh, I wouldn't say misses, uh, so to say, sir, but it will be more like maybe delay. We have uh, now come there. Uh, but and, and one of the foremost of them is the entire doctor ecosystem. I think uh, doctor is at the center of all of this, uh, be it uh, you trying to buy a medicine or you are going for a tertiary care or it is about any kind of a lab transaction and so on and so forth. Now, if your starting point itself uh, gets solved, and if there you see a large uh, part of adoption, I think the rest of the things automatically will see uh, these changes that are very, very uh, dynamic. And uh, the initiatives that we are doing now with microsite, I think uh, it's interesting, but there has to be a far more push uh, on how we should involve doctors uh, into creating this ecosystem uh, this is, uh, and, and doctors are the closest to patients and that is where all the trust gets established. So that would be one area where I think we should definitely invest as a, as a team. I think the other, again, as I uh, think about it, it's not a miss, but more delayed. Uh, if you look at large adoption of any kind of a population scale ecosystem that we have seen, be it Aadhaar, uh, Aadhaar became Aadhaar or became a household thing when actually the direct bank transfers kicked in. So DBT just changed the way people started thinking of Aadhaar and KYC and Aadhaar led KYC and so on and so forth, which was foundational in the large scale adoption. Same is if we look at uh, the whole UPI stack, a large scale adoption of UPI stack was when people like us, like who are going to pay uh, are actually uh, ready to pay using uh, UPI. And uh, that could have happened because of demonetization, a lot of push, COVID also fueled many of these things. But that resulted in where UPI is today. It took a while for all of these large scale platform that today we feel is like part of our lives, right? Similarly, I think there has to be a very strong preposition on uh, ABDM framework, ABHA, for the payers. If you look at it in those, in these two aspects, where there was a direct bank transfer, the payer is uh, government. There has been a big incentive for government to start doing that from top to bottom. Same is in case of UPI. When I go to that uh, chai wala and I say that I want to pay by UPI, 
then uh, he would go ahead and say that, okay, yes, I have to be onboarded into the UPI ecosystem, and it was not there uh, before that. So these kind of fundamental changes for payers, which essentially is, in our case, insurance, a large payer, how can we incentivize insurance players? And second, how can we incentivize the patients? A very interesting story that we have observed at GoIBO when I used to work at GoIBO as a CTO co-founder. When government came up and said that UPI, there is no MDRs, right? The banks have started passing uh, us uh, that there are no MDRs, so practically those transactions for us were free. Now, because these transactions were free, we ended up uh, giving that money back to the consumers. Like if you buy a hotel from us, if you buy a flight from us, you'll get discounts, which is a larger discounts when you uh, do the transaction on UPI. And that resulted in savings for us and better conversion for us. And private sector, sir, is definitely opportunist, right? We have to look at the opportunities that are lying there and on top of it, we are constrained, we don't have infinite resources. So in this environment, if we can work on uh, these two key constituents, trying to get doctors aligned with the entire mission, mission as much as possible, and also work with payers, be it insurance and patients, to make sure that they start asking uh, for uh, ABHA and then consultations through that and then uh, tertiary care and so on and so forth, would actually uh, change a lot uh, on this, especially in the speed of adoption for private uh, sector. So that would be my remarks. Thanks, Vikal. Uh, my next question would be to uh, Om Manchanda ji. Um, there is a lot of talk about UPI and uh, um, we often in our internal meetings discuss about UPI, ONDC and all similar um, Thank you, sir. And what and what similar uh, innovations and digital public infrastructure India has created? Um, what do you think about as to how EBDM can become the UPI of healthcare? Um, uh, first of all, thank you for having me on this platform. And uh, I've been engaged in this conversation for the last couple of years. And I'll probably take the focus away from this whole thing to a, on a conceptual thinking because we work in a business environment. And 24 by 7, uh, my job is to really satisfy and delight my customer. And I always constantly s keep looking uh, for what are the needs of my customer. And if you look at our own journey uh, in pathology labs, we've actually constantly focus on enhancing quality, enhancing service levels, convenience, whether it's a home collection, and everything actually, that's what we are always doing. So if I take that example and put this whole ABDM initiative, a question that often I ask is, what is in it for me as a patient? If my patient uh, standing in front of me asks for that I need uh, my record to be pushed into whatever this ABHA, Thing, then I have to do it. I have no other option. But if the patient does not ask for it, then I don't feel the need to do it. So I think my sort of a first sort of suggestion would be that uh, for any proposition, you have a core customer. While there are multiple other people sitting on the fence, which could be provider, could be doctor, could be else, somebody else, but there is still a core customer for any idea of whose problem you are trying to solve. Uh, to my mind, that core customer is nobody else other than patient. And I'll give you two, three real life examples which I've currently experienced in the last one week. Uh, my daughter, younger daughter lives in the US and uh, she called me, she needed uh, all her vaccination certificates for something. And I said, I don't know where they are. And then she's struggling because she, during the time of admission also, she actually had the same problem. And uh, we went to a doctor, we couldn't actually find that, those certificates. 
And then just imagine if you, those certificates were in digital form, even if they were not there at that time when the vaccination was done, I could have probably scanned it and kept it in one place. Then I'll give another example of my wife. She was in diagnosed with some syndrome, but those symptoms she's been having for almost 15 years. And she complained about dry eyes. We ended up going to a, a eye doctor. Then over a period of time, she started complaining of some muscular pains. We ended up going to orthopedics. And it continued like that for almost 10, 15 years till I actually happened to talk to some rheumatologist and explain to him about all the symptoms on a casual conversation over a dinner. And he kept asking me a few other things. And then quickly he said, please get this test done. And there we had a diagnosis. And it happened almost after 15 years. Now just imagine if this entire trace of history or all the meetings that she has had with the doctor were together, my sense is this diagnosis would have been done at least eight, 10 years before. Because it was not all in one place and it was all those dots were not connected because this, this whatever was happening in the eyes was a symptom Whatever was happening in the muscular was a symptom. The core disease was somewhere else. Now, I am 110% convinced that this is a great idea, but it probably needs to be communicated because sometimes when we also go to a customer, customer probably does not know there's a solution that exists for our problem. It's like often it is said that if uh, Apple as a company had gone to the customer and asked for do they need iPhone, they probably wouldn't have told them because they didn't know that something like that can is possible or they can't even imagine. I think this is also some solution like that. The power of this idea probably needs to be communicated to the patient. Uh, here lies the challenge. The challenge is how do you reach that inflection point where it takes off on its own? And I'll give another example, parallel example of LinkedIn. I don't know how many of you are aware about LinkedIn. When it had come, and many of us actually had just become member. I was also one of them about 15, 20 years back. And then I suddenly realized that I have put my profile, but after that, what do I do with it? For many years, actually, I didn't even access LinkedIn. But then what happened? Suddenly, LinkedIn became very useful to me. Why did it become useful? Because a lot of my friends became members. Even then also, it was not a great use. I know this gentleman very well, but what do I need to do on LinkedIn? Then he started posting something very interesting on LinkedIn, some article he writes. Then I started going there. Then I also got, somebody said, do you like my article? Then I also felt like I also should post it. Then it became like a sharing of knowledge. Then somebody else came into this LinkedIn saying that, okay, there are a lot of candidates who are seeking jobs and employers started posting the jobs there. Then suddenly it became a job portal. But if you come to think of it, this network was solving some problem of the members of this network. And I have a feeling now, that's where the point Dr. Karthik was making, is that for this network to become popular or reach that inflection point, there are stakeholders. Now, while we have defined core as a patient, but there are equally stakeholders. Now, that is where a person like me would come as a stakeholder, because I'm a lab company. Then there's a provider who is a stakeholder, which is a hospital. Then the doctor who is a stakeholder. I would suggest that collectively all of us should sit down that what is it for each stakeholder to make it successful? Who knows that there is some value add for the doctors to use this network? There is some information he or she is not only giving, but also seeking out of this network. Uh, I'm not expert in the, all these areas, but I think if we start putting down a small conversation amongst doctors, what is the value add they are looking for? Can this network provide those value adds? Uh, I think could be a great sort of way to for the success, uh, success of this. Uh, being a sales and marketing person, I think we must use some kind of celebratory endorsement for the benefit of this, uh, how they have benefited by using this entire network and real life use cases, not just global stuff. You pick specific example, how it benefited them by using this particular network. As I explained to you, had it, so use cases, blow them up and advertise. I think probably 
uh, we reach that, there's something called network effect, which is very common in e-commerce businesses. You reach that point, after that, I think all of us have to do this heavy lifting to take this point and then leave it there. Then it'll take off, which is what UPI. The, sorry, I, I'll take one more point I want to highlight here is the frequency of use. I think that's where when we draw parallel to UPI, probably we miss a point that UPI is something I use virtually, uh, at least my wife uses three, four times in a day. It's like a phone, WhatsApp, I use virtually every minute, right? But somehow this is that product where the frequency of use may not be that high. And uh, I just want to quote one data point. We often have talked about this. So we, I just did an analysis for all our patients. You will be surprised to know on an average, only once in a year they visit our lab. While there are certain patients who visit frequently, but that's a use of our facility. Now it's a need, it's not a want. Nobody wants to be in a lab. Nobody wants to be in a hospital. It's a need, then only you will go there. So I have a feeling that amongst all the universe, it may be useful to pick the high frequency users because they will be the early adopters of this network because they will see the use of this network even more than less frequent user. So first catch hold of early adopters on all sides for patient as well as even other stakeholders also. So early adopter in stakeholder would be people like us who have very high good quality IT system. Now smaller labs may not have that. Large hospital chains will have that. So pick early adopters and I think also pick people with a little bit of a high tech mindset, people are used to technolo technology. And once you reach a particular point, then I think it'll just blow up. Is is this just wanted to say, share that. Thank you. My next question would be to Neil, sir. Uh, you have been here at NHA for uh, quite some time advising us on uh, various issues. Very, very helpful in uh, drafting the DHIS uh, policy. Um, what are your inputs? I mean, what, what should we uh, do next for private sector adoption? Thanks a lot, uh, Vikram, and real privilege and pleasure to be here. Um, uh, thanks for that. See, uh, I think having seen this and been a, a student of the subject for some time now, one thing is certain that there's no magic wand. There is no one thing we can do that will solve the problem. The second is it's not a very easy journey. This is a <coughs> program which is a in the federal space, the center and state both are involved quite actively. This is a program which is kind of very difficult to mandate, uh, very core to that extent. So I think this will be difficult journey. No, and the other one is no country has managed to do it fast at all. Although that's not a, I wouldn't take that as a automatically. We've done many things much faster than any other country has done. So, but even then it's not going to be there is no one pill to take, no one magic wand to do. And I think, so which is where I think perseverance around many things which we've been doing, you articulated many of them, kind of Dr. Vishal Chauhan spoke about a few, Homan Chandaji spoke about a few, so we'll have to do that. So when I was thinking kind of since yesterday, and probably seven mantras which came to my mind, which things which we could do in a more uh, sustained basis and not uh, in no particular order of preference, I'll try and put it. I think. Uh, see, the first is we started with this DHIS and you mentioned. I think we should not look at it as a short-term scheme. We talk about UPI successful. UPI provided cash incentives back for about five, five, six years, despite having scaled up so much. And we're talking about months. So I think, and we heard in one of the earlier sessions also, that I think the private sector needs that certainty that this is there for some time. It's not a short-term uh, thing and tomorrow morning it will go away. I think that's somewhere to provide that certainty. And the amount of money we're spending is not uh, huge. Dr. Karthik spoke about the High Tech Act, the amount of money which you have poured was billions. We're talking about tens of uh, crores, uh, maybe a hundred crores. It's not a large sum of money. And I, and I think in particular for the private sector, but there is a new cost, et cetera, which is coming in. So there, give that certainty for a longer period of time that this money would be uh, available. I think second point which came in somewhere is drive the payers. Cash is king. 
we all know, uh, know it. So in that, I think whether we start with PMJY, uh, yesterday I was sitting in the other session where Dr. Indu Bhushan, the founder, uh, CEO of uh, NHA was also there. And he mentioned a very interesting point which caught my attention that, and I recollected being a part then, that the reason why ABDM was handed over to NHA was because PMJY was so much IT enabled and so much of enablement of digitization PMJY could do, which would be the foundation for ABDM. I think somewhere while we are doing many things in that direction, yet, and the amount of benefit with uh, PMJY also gets by getting better quality digital records is immense. Their ability to process claims faster is much better, to process, uh, identify fraud is much better, to provide much better research data, as Nam would say, if you have a real high quality digital thing coming in, that information value changes dramatically. So that's one end of the payer ecosystem. And we pay a lot of money, we pay an, uh, about 25 odd thousand hospitals are associated, half of them are uh, private sector hospitals. And I think all of them, if they come in, and I think Dr. Manjanda and I were talking earlier during lunch, and we said that, look, sabko koi ek rasta dikha de na. Kisi karan se, if the hospital does it once, for one reason, then he'll do it for the others also. That fear goes away, et cetera, et cetera. Similarly, on the other payer side, I think we've seen the power of the regulator, again, yesterday's session when we were seeing the uh, early today morning uh, with the insurance company. The insurance companies are wanting to come faster, but the benefits are there much longer. So take it much beyond ABHA. The cost of processing, again, for all the private insurance companies come down. So how their ability to identify a patient becomes faster. So you, and then claim processing becomes faster, payment becomes faster. Uh, being able to give cheaper insurance becomes possible because you're able to get the real health data of an individual. So I think, again, using that and a very concerted effort. I know we've started there, but I think, again, that's why I'm saying no one's uh, pill there. Uh, third point, I'd say, is speedier uh, implementation with our partners, the integration with our partners. I think some good initiatives have started there. I think one which I really liked was where we got all the insurance companies into a room in three days. All of them got, 19 of them got their uh, certifications. 29. 29 of them got their certifications done there and then. I think great example. Until that day, for the last two years, we had managed to get about 100. In three days, we got 29. I think, and what more can we do around that thing? I know we did the next one uh, there. How do we get, because the private sector, I can imagine, does not have the bandwidth, the availability to spend months and months. Some people, sorry, have spent, because their priorities could be wrong. I don't know who's at fault. But it's taken a year also out of the 800 odd people who are wanting to be integrated. If 800, if 20 of them, or 29, 30 people come together in one batch, you provide all the resources, get them done in three days. I think all the private sector companies who are sitting here, if they know, I, teen din mein integration ho jayega, mein chale jaunga. The cost, effort, everything comes down uh, uh, drastically uh, then. I think the fourth point I'd like to speak about is the, I, I think Dr. Manchanda spoke as well, the frequent user thing. I think we are, in a way, doing carpet bombing. And I was speaking to the Chai team yesterday. Uh, the a clinic, the way we are running the microsite program, we go to a clinic. There we ask a doctor, you have prescription, you digitize kar do. And his main point is, half his patients are only somebody who's coming with a, a cough and cold. He does not need to see a past prescription. He does not need to go any other test. He does not need to go any other test. He does not need to go any other test. So the, immediately, that is the use case we try and push the doctor. It doesn't work. Versus now, let's imagine, uh, paint a picture of something which uh, Vishal Chauhan ji mentioned, of that one crore NCD patient, diabetes patient to be simple, who has to come back every month. Those same diabetes patient become classic, or the, the probability of becoming a heart patient is much higher. 
their probability of getting a kidney uh, or a uh, issue is much higher. Every other disease. So I think if we are involved the user, and then we always struggle that which user to involve. If uh, if I am a user who visits a doctor one time a year to try and convince me up my health record banalo, usse aapko fayda hoga, it's probably low. But if you go to these one crore people, if you go to all the cancer patients, if you go to all the geriatric care, our senior citizens who even forget what medicines they need to take, if you go to what Dr. Oman Chandra mentioned as a child, the vaccination, so these, I think there, there would be probably eight, ten categories, and maybe the ten crore odd people in the country who visit doctors more frequently than anybody else. And the 10% will give us that escape velocity, sir, we're talking about. And if we are able to get them, and those 10 crore people go, sir, kaise convince karein? And there we can get to them, and wo ja kar ke demand kare. Sir, tell me if a patient walked in, a diabetes patient walked into your clinic and said, nahi, aapko abha banana padega, mera, because otherwise the record nahi aega. So you have no option. You have no option. I think that's probably a way, and we've always struggled how to pull the... Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. We actually would love that because uh, many times, and uh, all of you must have been to a lab, I usually ask for name, phone number, etc. right? For me, ABHA ID becomes a marker for me to pick the record completely out of that instead of asking phone numbers. In fact, phone number has a bigger problem because one phone number, multiple patients. But here, one person, one ABHA ID, we are done. In fact, I will be more than happy to have patients with ABHA ID. Okay, so moving to the fifth point, I think somewhere, and we all celebrate UPI. One of the reasons which UPI happened, that those who had the ability to do UPI technically was forced by RBI to do it. Whether it was a soft force, a hard force, we can debate on that. Banks was not given a choice by RBI that ki, ki you aap UPI mein apna system lao ke lao. Right? They were given, and many of us here would have studied UPI, and I did study that closely. They were forced. There are many people in our ecosystem, health ecosystem, who have the money, who have already digitized. 80% of our lab reports in the country which are issued are issued on a piece of computer, or a piece of paper <laughs> generated by a computer. You hardly get a lab report which is handwritten. Every uh, big hospital chain that you go to, in the, that hospital chain, you, they have entire digital. But they will not send it to my PHR app because I want to do the hospital chain. Ke paas karna chana chana. The same issue was there with RBI, with RBI and the banks. Banks were not very keen that their money went to the Paytm mein Ram se chala gaya. Paytm was not very keen when they were a closed wallet. Uh, and it almost RBI system had to force that they opened up their uh, wallet thereafter. So I think somewhere the regulatory power for people who can do it. I don't think that we should think of regulatory for the last small doctor sitting in Motihari district uh, without having connectivity, etc. They needn't come in first. Again, but people who have the ability, who have the technical prowess, who are already generating digital records, I think there we have to look at the mandate. And it can't be that, look, I will, but the penal, I think Om sir mentioned about many benefits. Her wife being able to be diagnosed seven years earlier. I'm sure all the hospitals we went for the biggest hospital. And so the seven to eight years before, uh, I, I see no reason why a health provider can, for their uh, business benefit alone, penalize the customer to this effect. I think that's a, in that controlled way we could reuse regulation. I'm not saying uh, use regulation in a bigger way. One small point internally for the sixth point I'd like to say for the sixth mantra for NHA itself, I think, and I see some of my tech colleagues from NHA also sitting here. We need to stabilize our IT operations. Kabi kabi wo band ho jata hai, kuch difficulty aati hai. And I think, I don't know whether I'm resonating with some of my uh, kind of private folks there. I've heard very frankly with from many of them, ki wo nahi chalta, sir, to phir hum kya kar rahe hai. If it is a mission critical system, uh, UPI, I think very rarely fails now. So I think if you want to emulate UPI, we have to do that. Last but not the least, the seventh mantra I'd like to say. Yesterday we had a very brilliant session on privacy. I think what the our two great lawyer friends, uh, Rahul and Anurad, were able to do was to scare our, to scare the shit off from all providers that ye privacy se pata nahi kya ho jayega, bahut khyal rakhna hai. 
And what we also realized, what Jay Satnarana ji said, ki ABDM has privacy embedded into it. So how do we kind of position it to a provider that look, if you have complied with ABDM, if you have integrated with ABDM, kind of more or less your privacy is sorted. So suddenly from that fear ki privacy mein kya hoga yaar, asha, ko sabko wo itna, no, not everybody would be able to afford a Rahul Mathana or whatever. So, but in a simple way, if you are able to get it done, aapka privacy is all ho gaya. And that's the seventh, uh, and I'll, I'll take all of these actions for myself as well, but I think just, uh, the thank you, Ari. those are the seven comments I had. Uh, I'll come uh, to Dr. Sutapa. Uh, Ma'am, uh, you uh, are at IHMR. Um, what is the role of research uh, uh, in all these things that we are talking about? And uh, a lot of data is generated, digital data is generated. How can we use it uh, for epidemiological uh, usage? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, NHF, first of all, for giving us this opportunity. And thank you, Vikram, for pointing out a very important gap in this whole ecosystem, which is not very often talked about. So before I come back to your question, let me just take you all to the basics of research. See, there are two functionalities. One is program, and the second is research. Research and program, these two components, they never talk to each other. And that is the biggest problem that we are facing as of now. But with the advent of implementation science, which is currently the in thing, the whole aim is to see how research can feed into programs and how programs can address the different components and then feed back into improvement of the program itself. So it's a kind of a cycle that we are trying to adopt and develop as of now. Now, when we talk of research, there are basically two kinds of research. One is primary, one is secondary. The other one is secondary. Primary research, it is important because it lies in the hands of the investigator, but it has some important problems. Problems in the sense that it requires a donor, it requires resources, it requires funding, it requires human, HR human resources, ethics approval, and also it can only be conducted over a certain period of time. You cannot keep on doing the same primary research over and over again. The other alternative to this is a secondary research, which means you analyze whatever is already collected. Secondary research can be a very useful source of research work, provided they're able to fulfill some of the criteria, important criteria which are mandatory uh, before using any secondary data for uh, research purposes. First of all, it, it should be reliable. Completeness, the periodicity, the authenticity, and the accessibility. Only if you're able to fulfill all these criteria will you be able to use secondary data for research purposes. But then, in India, secondary data is a huge untapped resource till date. And when we talk of secondary data, it again can come from two sources, public and private. Any research which is currently being done in India, they all are from the public resources. So, so the private thing is again an un sort of untapped or not so very you know, uh, used resources for that matter. And the reasons are simple, because there are very few private players who are ready to willing to share their private data with the researchers. Now, having said that, we cannot really ignore the private bit of it, because if you go back way back in 1947, there were hardly 10% of the, of people used to go to the private sector. Now it's almost more than 80%. So if you are not touching that private sector, we are actually losing a large bit of data. Now, now coming to your question, how can ABDM help? So ABDM is one platform which can help integrate the public and the private sector data. Because you can compare public and private sector data only when they're comparable. So there has to be some synergy between the two. And ABDM in itself as a platform, it provides that opportunity to integrate data both from the public and private sector and hence the quality and the richness of the data increases. Now, uh, ABDM would provide a useful source of data because of the real-time data availability. But it's a huge repository. It's not possible for one or two people to analyze it. So it means if we look into the data analysis bit of it, we are going into an area or era of big data analysis, which is the in thing today. If you have to analyze the data of the entire country, we need algorithms. And that, 
and for that you have to depend on the artificial intelligence and machine learning which is again if we are trained in that we are taking ourselves to the next level of research which is again to say that programs can also help improve the research capabilities of different teaching and academic institutions in the country one big opportunity for this abdm is to help us to uh, do some longitudinal studies longitudinal studies otherwise cannot be supported by any funding body or donor so this wealth of information can be utilized to conduct longitudinal studies and what this will lead to is to study the natural progression of diseases which is otherwise not possible under any circumstances to see what happens if the patient is treated and if the patient is not treated so that also is i mean obviously generate a, a lot of new knowledge which can again go back to the program setting or it can also be used to improve our clinical you know treatment protocols because it is centralized health data ai algorithms can prove to be very useful resources to predict diseases so to improve the, uh, the predictability of the outcome that also is a very useful uh, impact or uh, i mean use of data if at all we are able to do that properly and that for from programmatic point of view if you are able to predict the demand for the medical services you can also optimize your resources so that is again going back to economics and say that if you are able to do it properly you are going to in the longer run gain resources and save resources for the country this will also help us in remote monitoring and better surveillance will be able to pick up the public health threats very early more than anybody i mean other other resources so this i think is going to be a very useful platform but then we cannot wait for more than 15 years to see that okay this turns out to be a, a useful resource for the country's i mean research uh, portfolio to grow up but i think uh, some subtle points if you want to involve the public or the private health sector one idea could be if we can include um, abdm as an important parameter in the nqas assessment in the nabh accreditation in the nbl accreditation that will prove to be a kind of a softer way of pushing people to adopt it directly or indirectly and last but not the least we need people and institutions to analyze this data so you need to rope in academic institutions at this stage itself train them properly and see how best they can use the data which is available with us thank you so much thank you ma'am uh, you spoke of implementation research i just wanted to inform everybody that uh, with uh, access health we are trying to do a small implementation research study of the scan and share experiment as to how it has been implemented what things uh, uh, can be improved how much time uh, is uh, really saved and to create a sort of feedback uh, loop wherein we get any feedback from the field from our microsites from our, from the places where scan and share and other initiatives are implemented uh, leads to improvement in our uh, designs of aba hpr hfr our systems um, thank you for that uh, i'll uh, have to summarize the session and uh, um, we have uh, to assemb we have we all have to assemble in the plenary hall uh, by 4 o'clock so i'll just uh, uh, summarize what i have learned from uh, uh, the session today uh, we have to identify our customers uh, we have to give them uh, uh, something tangible uh, vikalp mentioned that we should give opportunities uh, uh, to the private sector Uh, we have to be focused on various aspects related to our uh, payers um, maybe work on more incentives extend the uh, digital health incentive scheme uh, become technically more capable uh, learn from uh, the global sector and uh, uh, use legal levers uh, involve more uh, academic institutions um, maybe next time when we come and have this discussion again in arogya manthan 2023 uh, we'll be able to be uh, uh, we'll be able to say that yes we have uh, done a bit but it's a long journey um, thank you uh, everybody for your presence here uh, we would not we would not have time for the q and a uh, we'll have to wind it up uh, now thank you once again thank you
So I would like to thank to all our dignitaries for such an insightful and enriching session. As we embark to the journey to encourage private sector engagement in digital health, now let us remember that our ultimate goal is just to not to innovate for an innovation sake, but to improve the life of individuals and communities of the country. Now I would like to conclude the session. I would request Mr. Vikram Pagaria, sir, to present the memento to the co-chairperson, Dr. Kartik Adapa, sir. Now, may I request Dr. Kardik Atapa, sir, to present the mementos to our all panelists. Mr. Neel Ratan, sir. Dr. Oman Chanda, sir. Dr. Sutapa B. Nyogi. Mr. Vikram Sani. Mr. Vikram Pagaria, sir. Thank you.